Hi, this is Joy J. Moore with a special announcement. Our Working Preacher Fall campaign is in full swing, and we're so grateful to each and every one of you who have given so generously already. Working Preacher relies on donors like you to provide quality content week after week. When you make a gift before October 31st, we will send you a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Digital Jazz is a workbook to help preachers apply media and technology appropriately to the proclamation of the gospel. Go to workingpreacher.org today to unlock your gift and support this important resource for preachers around the globe. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The texts for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost on October 16th, 2022 are these. Genesis 32, 22 through 31. If you're following the semi-continuous first readings, that is Jeremiah 31, 27 through 34. Psalm 121. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 4, 5. Then the gospel text is Luke 18, 1 through 8, the so-called parable of the persistent widow or the unjust judge or both of them. <laughs> I'm glad you read the text because then I was looking at my packet and like, oh, no, we're not. <laughs> ah, even, even the, even the, Sermon Brainwave host needs a reminder of what the texts are. We do. All right. Yeah, people think we're just making this up, but we actually have got research. Yes, yes. <laughs> Notes in front of us. I love yes. this parable so much. Tell us more. Because it's so easy to understand on the mm. surface, right? It's one of these parables that tells you at the beginning, or at least Luke tells you what it's about. This is about praying always and not losing heart. And you read it and you think, yeah, kind of. It's kind of about that. But it's, you know, on, on the one hand, it's really clear. It's saying God is not like this unjust judge. This unjust judge is a snake. But even a snake, you can eventually, you know, squeeze a little bit of justice out of if you work hard enough. But no way is God like that. So in theory, it makes a lot of sense. But then I look at my own life of faith and I think, no, God feels a lot more like this judge who I can't ever wake up. Or I can't ever bend to my will. You know what I mean? So it says this is not what God is like. We all know that, right? Hmm. But I think part of the the brilliance of the parable, or maybe this is my own sinfulness, <laughs> is it really does seem like this is who God is. I mean, most of our experience is there are many more stories of faithful people who have poured their heart out to God and not received the justice they were seeking hmm. than there are of people who offered one prayer and <laughs> snap, right? <laughs> Everything became equitable just like that. So it's, you know what I mean? I think, I think that's part of the brilliance of the parable that it pulls us mm -hmm. into our experiences like this. And I think the parable does urge us to, to be like this widow who, you know, there are a few interpretations out there that make her kind of a sucker, but I think that's not, mm. I, it doesn't feel true to the way the story is told to me. There's something heroic about her, especially when you think that from a legal perspective, she doesn't have much to stand on in that culture. Mm -hmm. Yet she keeps showing up. Yeah. I, I think the other important background to what you said, Matt, is to recognize that the passage just before is is teaching about the end and prediction about the end times. And so that that for them to, for Jesus to say, or for Luke to say, Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and to not lose heart. The not lose heart uh, has a, can have a wider context than what the, what the widow wishes or wants in terms of justice in the face of her opponent. Uh, but it's also that the, the wider, that wider contents of uh, context of a tenacious faith in the midst of uh, in the midst of present ordeals, or in the midst of uh, one's one's challenges and one's realities, and so it's uh, it 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 particularizes what her ordeal is, but sort of the wider sense of what uh, what we face or what uh, what 
what we're coming up against in terms of our own in our own faith communities or as a church that uh, that role of of prayer and tenacity and persistence nevertheless she persisted uh, is is certainly a, <laughs> a a summary of this passage certainly there's uh, uh, the, the pu pulling to verse eight, um, which goes along with the fact that this is uh, a response to this idea of end times. That question: um, Will God will God find faith on earth? Will the Son of Man find faith on earth? Uh, Matt, I think your opening um, is a kind of a, a self reflection. Many of us can can use to say um, we might not have that faith. And this is a parable that invites us to uh, have that faith so that when the Son of Man comes, when the end time happens, um, we have shown that faith by doing what uh, Stanley Harwas calls, uh, Lord, teach us to beg. Um, and uh, one of my professors said that um, um, Robert Tuttle used to say, when, when we're asking God again and again and again, we're just doing what Jesus told us to do. Being persistent, um, and that that persistence uh, is born out of faith. It's not born out of doubt. It's actually born out of, I know God is capable, and I believe God will. And so I'm going to ask God one more time. Uh, and uh, to, to, to hear it, in, in some ways, if, um, if you last week preached from, um, uh, preached from Jeremiah, uh, there's that same sense of this is a prayer before the end times. This is a prayer in the midst of the horrific situation that is a prayer that is a lifestyle, that is a way of being that is consistent with faith because God is trustworthy. I wonder if, I, I like that, the, especially the begging Heart and the way of talking about persistence and what kind of prayer is a quote unquote appropriate prayer. <laughs> and sometimes that's what it is. I, I wonder if one of the ways I would preach back at myself or preach to a congregation filled with people like me is to say, don't be too quick to put yourself in the position of a first century widow that mm. to pray a lot when you have agency to make change and to get frustrated with God that change doesn't come because all you're doing is praying, right? There's something about that too, right? That yeah. she in the story, I think, is a bit of a of an extreme, again, from the perspective, not all widows in the first century were poor and powerless, but mm -hmm. I think that's the implication here. That sometimes we do just pray and then think, well, what's going, well, how come God's not acting when that power is sometimes more in our hands than we realize, maybe not on a macro global level, but certainly in a more local, personal, familial level. Mm -hmm. It's the joke of uh, um, a canoe came by, a helicopter came by yeah. to get a person in the midst <laughs> oh, of the yeah. flood. And I'm they waiting for God to save me. It's like, you know, where, where were you, God? And it's like, who do you think sent the, the canoe and the helicopter? <laughs> you know, we, God has heard our prayers and given us some agency. Wow, I really appreciate that, Matt. Yeah. I think one, one thing, too, with this passage is to, when, going back to chap, uh, verse 8, that when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That the that there's that there is though something about the kind of faith that she's demonstrating the connection between faith and prayer or that faith is that prayer is a a result of a kind of a, a certain kind of faith or the kind of prayer that she's because that per persistence in prayer also requires i i, I think a trust and that the, the other way that faith another way that faith can be translated as trust. Mm -hmm. And so uh, will he find trust on earth could be another way to think about this. That's that, you know, trust in God's uh, answering God, trust in God's presence, trust in God's listening and hearing to our pleas and our begging. And, uh, and so that that phrase of will he find faith on earth doesn't become this sort of ubiquitous what does faith mean? But there's a particularity here about what she's doing 
that mm-hmm. invites uh, invites a kind of way to think about uh, what faith is and how is how is it that prayer and faith are connected mm-hmm. that we might not be able that we don't perhaps think about as often. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you think about reading Genesis 32 with this, which is, uh, of, of course, a great story all by itself. Yeah. And one that people need to know. And people love it. <laughs> yes. And in some ways, it's a demonstration of this, no? Uh, where, you know, there's a persistence on the part uh, uh, here of saying, I want to know your name. I want to know your name. I want to know your name. Uh, I want to receive your blessing. I want to receive your blessing. I'm going to, I'm going to keep wrestling. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with this until I get what I'm desiring, um, which is consistent with Jacob's um, personality from, you know, from his very birth. Uh, There's a way where there's a parallel uh, in this reading that, that can be pulled out of that. Uh, that uh, I, I, again, you know, I like to read the, the text side by side. And this one, when you do that, you see something different, or for me, that I don't normally see in that text. Mm-hmm. I have something yeah. to say about it also, but that's my first thought. Well, I think, I, yeah, I, that's always what happens, or at least ideally that's what happens, right, is when you put uh, in the in sticking to the lectionary, it's putting texts in conversation that yields new interpretive possibilities and lenses with other texts. But particularly with the wrestling piece, maybe invites a sense of, you know, what does it feel like? Or what what do you feel like when you're in that place of persistent prayer with God? Uh, and does it feel like a wrestling? Does it feel, you know, what what is it... How does it get embodied in your body? How do you experience that? Uh, that not just a description of this is part of a life of faith, but then how does that feel? Where what is that? Is it frustrating? Is it you know? Is it <laughs> does it call upon your you know your sort of wherewithal and your strength that you didn't think you had? Uh, so maybe it gives a little bit more sense of yeah do you know what I mean just not just pray and be persistent but just acknowledging what what that requires but what that's actually going to feel like I think that's one way this story kind of could be put in conversation with clearly this is not a a wonderful um meditative moment for Jacob (laughs) yeah yeah Mm mm-hmm it's not. Uh, uh, Rachel Wren in her commentary says it's perhaps the best description of the life of faith in the entire Bible. And mm-hmm. I might agree uh, with that, but it's it's interesting that it's paired with prayer in, in terms of how the lectionary is guiding our imaginations. Mm-hmm. I use it to talk about biblical interpretation sometimes with students and others, that this is part of what, what preachers do in their study and what what teachers do and it obviously fits other parts of life too and this idea of one's whole body being engaged and one's whole prayer being i've never had the attention span or maybe the the care to pray in a way that was agonizing except Mm. for those moments in life that are real tragedies but um, but some people do and for some people prayer is very much embodied and and it's the word i want laborious, I guess, right? Leaves scars, leaves, Mm -hmm. leaves injuries in some ways, or your body feels it. And, Mm -hmm. and the same should be true with service. And there are other ways of embodying faith besides just interpreting the Bible and praying. Um, In fact, lots of other ways, but I just think about that too. I'm I'm Mm -hmm. so glad that the story is just the details, right? Of it happening Mm -hmm. all night, um, I, th- you know, we've talked about this for 14 years, yeah. <laughs> Caroline and I have, but I think Jacob wins this battle. I think in the, he's in a sense, finally getting something out of God. God still, you know, touches the hip just to send a little reminder, but, mm-hmm. but there's something about this. That's a, not just a God who says, I dare you to find the right wrestling hold to beat me, <laughs> but a God who's just engaged in this with us and a God who needs to be, or who welcomes us to. Uh, remind God of those promises of the divine promises that are for mm-hmm. us and our neighbors. 
who comes to where we are, because this yeah. is the time when Jacob's not in a good space, and God meets, the, the angel meets um, him in that place, um, and um, a God who engages, um, and then a God who does not leave us the same. Uh, one of the things that is uh, that can be noted uh, as an approach to this text is a recognition that, um, yes, Jacob wins this round. Jacob gets what Jacob is asking for, but God is getting what God has promised. So God has made this promise that Jacob is going to be in the line of the descendants of Abraham and Sarah to be a blessing for all the nations. And so what happens to Jacob who becomes Israel, what happens to Israel as a whole is what God intends to do with all of humanity. And so there's um, a transformation that happens when you encounter God, that you may get exactly what you ask for, but are you leaving the same? Because if you win with God and you're not transformed, then God is at your beck and call. And sometimes I've heard, um, you know, God has to answer our prayer if we do these five steps. And then that makes God the genie in our bottle. And this is a demonstration that says, no, God has an overarching journey that God is bringing us on. And are we willing to surrender to the limitations that means that God is ultimately the one who's setting the direction? And I think this, this story tells that as well. Mm -hmm. I think too, another, an, another invitation into this text for people, uh, could be naming that, um, you know, what, what is their hip displacement or whatever you want to call, <laughs> yeah. whatever you want to, whatever you want to call this, which I find also just very interesting about not to get, uh, you know, like, you know, overly, uh, anatomical, but, uh, that that it's you know it, it's it's a hip issue which then changes of course the way you walk and so that there's I don't know there's something curious about that that G, that that Jacob's walk is going to be different yes. um, I love it uh, you know then uh, and that uh, that that's the that's the detail that we're left with the other thing I would I would do is to invite people, invite your congregation to think about what has been or where has been their pineal. Uh, can they recall their pineal moment or that moment that, that, that they had that wrestling with God and that, that has had that kind of imprint on their uh, lives and their life of faith. And, uh, and it even, it, it could even be, you can invite that in the sermon, but you could even, you know, give it at the end of, of homework for people or a lot of different ways you could do that, like on social media or, you know, what has been your pineal moment, um, just to invite some maybe future conversation so that people not just, not just think about, oh yeah, I've had those times, but actually enter into a communal space of conversation of acknowledging uh, and naming and remembering those wrestlings with God. And because sometimes I'm not sure that we are as open to name the struggles as we are to name the highlights of God's presence in our lives. And so um, maybe it would make for some really, I think, lovely, honest, honesty about the challenges of faith and yeah, the way the whole pandemic was a pineal moment. <laughs> you know, especially, especially coming out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if, um, um, I, I tend not to give assignments at the end of sermons. I can to tend to follow uh, Henry Mitchell's celebration. Um, and so, um, I wonder if, um, maybe the work 
either that the congregation has done in the community through the midst of the pandemic or the work that has happened in the individual lives of members of the congregation that the pastor is privy to, to maybe get permission to share some of those stories. The public ones to share just as a reminder of how, you know, the congregation and community has come through um, scarred but whole, mm -hmm. um, or uh, permission to say, you know, here are a couple of people who are, 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 you know, Jacobs to Israel in our community and get permission to tell their story where it becomes an opportunity to celebrate what has happened uh, as a, a, a kind of a, um, a, a teaser or a, um, I can't think of what the, the, um, the, um, the metaphor is when you get a food and you taste it, you get to do a taste test, but just sort of a, a, a nibble of what is to come and, and to kind of invite folks to say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And that becomes an invitation for them to think about that and reflect on it for the next week. Demonstrate it rather than asked. Yeah. And I think the preacher could also do that with with the congregation, with the church. How is yes. the church? Uh, what's what is what is the limp that the church is left with there, that particular church because of the pandemic? Absolutely. Or, yeah. So you could do that as a communal yeah. sense as well. Jeremiah, if I if I dare, because of the words that you said, uh, Caroline, um, can we look at Psalm first? Sure. And the reason that I did it is because um, there's that moment in the midst of the wrestling where there's a looking up. And mm -hmm. this psalm can be used, um, as you suggested last week, can be used as a way of giving words to what is happening in Jacob's life in this moment. Um, mm -hmm. Looking up to the one who is our, our, our help. Um, I just... Um, I hadn't thought about that until you 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 set yeah. this up in terms of you know finding our our Pinnell moment. Um, so yeah. that that yeah. just struck me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. Anything else on the song, or should we look at this? Is our last uh, Jeremiah reading for people who are working their way through the prophets? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yep. it's a reading that we get a lot with the new commandment. But. Yes. Well, I think here, I mean, it could be, you know, it's maybe not necessarily to, I'm not usually the one to blend all the text together and come out with a theme, but, uh, but I do think that there's, to what extent, the need for a new covenant or to revisit the covenant with God is like a pineal moment, you know, it's um, that covenants are, this covenant with God is not, it takes work and it takes persistence and it takes effort and it takes trust, which the psalm, uh, which the psalm, the psalmist gives witness to. And, and that the way in which that that wrestling happens is because there is trust, but that uh, there's a there's a covenantal aspect to the text that we're talking about today, and the way in which we think about that. Uh, what does covenant mean, and what does it require? Uh, could be one way to go, maybe. This is I'm a new. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm going a different route entirely, so you go okay. ahead. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here in the sense that this is uh, one, one way of reading that is that this is a new covenant from um, Abraham, Isaac to Jacob, Israel, uh, in the sense of uh, not the same uh, of previous generations where this generation, now Jacob, has experienced God for for himself, and um, th th this is not the stories of my father and and my grandfather. This is now Jacob's story, and uh, um, it, it it begs the question for us in terms of do we need that moment in our lives? And as I think about the 
way that we're living right now? I think we definitely do. I don't know if we are demonstrating the kind of familiarity with the hospitality and promises of God um, that lives out that faith. And um, rather than this being a moment that we're in, maybe this is a moment we need to um, seek for ourselves, which is the way that this text is actually given, that the day will come. And uh, it might not be a bad idea for our listeners to read this uh, post-resurrection as yet to come because of the way that we've been acting um, in the name of Jesus, which may not demonstrate the hospitality and hope that is the righteousness of God. I was going to say something really different. I'll keep it super brief because I know we're short on time, but the the first half of the passage captures my attention, The where there's that, that undoing of the proverb about eating sour grapes and children's teeth being set on edge. And the what we see here is is a a change in the Old Testament's perspective and, or just kind of ongoing ethical reasoning about how much does one generation pay for or suffer from the sins of previous generations and how much of that is a statement about who God is, but how much of that I think too is an emerging sense of justice in in the kind of wisdom or thinking we see in the Old Testament. So it just makes me think about, and Steve Davidson brings up some of this in his commentary that's really useful in terms of not swinging too far to an individualistic point of view where I'm only responsible for my own actions. And to think about what that means for us uh, as a society, uh, as a church. Uh, I was recently was in a conversation with a friend who's Canadian uh, talking about uh, the sense in Canada of like land acknowledgements and to say that everybody is a treaty person or we are all mm-hmm. treaty people. And mm-hmm. that's that's controversial in some ways. But how, what does it mean to live in a lineage where ancestors have made and broken promises or ancestors have set out things, their best wisdom for what's going to be mutually beneficial for multiple parties? And how does that you know, whether, how are we either obligated to that or how are we responsible to that in some way? And this is no more than just about law and human rights, although it certainly is part of it. It's also about what that means for the promises the church makes about grace and about community. And mm. so I don't know if I were working on the prophets and I were for some reason was skipping over Luke 18 and the story of Jacob at the Javik, which would be crazy. Uh, I would, do some kind of, I would want to open up some conversation about that. How do we think about sin, responsibility, obligation, guilt, our neighbor, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Sorry, that was longer than I promised. So there is I'll let a, one of you take Tech and Timothy home. Yeah. There's a sense in that, Matt, where we do need to be attentive to the consequences tomorrow for the actions we make today. And uh, to, to, even though this is a future promise, Uh, to recognize that maybe we aren't living in that moment. And in some ways, that might be what 2 Timothy is also talking about, is that... um, Nice move. Look at you, tying text together. (laughs) Is that we are to endure in the midst of this and do the work of proclaiming the goodness and promises of God. And that's our task for that... I love to say this line from Steve Green's old song, that those who come behind us will find us to have been faithful. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to 2 Timothy, it's very easy, very simple, um, I think. And that is you dial into 2 Timothy 3.16 and just just blow that out of the water because it's such an oft- quoted verse in really unhelpful and incorrect ways. And, uh, and so it can be, maybe this is just a Sunday where you ditch everything that we talked about and you go to all scriptures inspired by God and pay attention to the commentary of what inspired really means that, uh, that the way in which inspired of courts gets equated with literal or infallible or inerrant. And, and actually it's all about, it's not about static, but it's about creative, 
creation, life-giving, life-breathing uh, reality of God. And so, uh, which is which is in part what we've been talking about, that, that this living, breathing, present God who, uh, who is present with us and uh, brings life in the midst of everything. <laughs>